Hi, um, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, the next speaker, Christy Choi. She's a second year PhD student in the computer science department. Uh, she was previously studying computer science at uh, Columbia and she's been really, really productive, a great student in the group. Uh, she's already won two fellowships, uh, the Stanford uh, uh, Graduate Research Fellowship, the NSF one. She's already produced uh, a couple of papers in probably less than a year. And uh, today she's gonna be talking about some of the work she's been doing with the Sachs group on using deep learning to improve uh, um, source channel coding systems. Hello, okay. Thanks Stefano for the intro. Today I'll be talking about neural joint source channel coding, which is some work that I did with Kadar, my lab mate Aditya, Saki, and my advisor Sam. Um, so just as a really brief introduction, there's been a lot of hype around deep generative models lately, and that's particularly motivated by the fact that within the past few years, there have been, been some really impressive successes. And so sort of the things that we can do with these models include things like style transfer, where we can basically map from one artistic style to another without explicitly training on paired examples. We can generate some really high quality images that basically look real. Um, you can also do this to a certain degree with text and audio as well. And these models also help um, in discovering new molecule combinations for drug discovery and a lot more. So there are a lot of different classes of generative models that you can choose to use for your problem. Today I'm going to be talking about the autoencoding approach um, as that is the most relevant to our problem setup. So what does it mean to autoencode something? So suppose I have a data set or like an image or a data point of interest. Autoencoding essentially just means that I put in my data through some mapping and I map it to some lower dimensional latent representation. Then I map it back down to my data space um, with the hope that, my, that the, the reconstruction that I obtain is relatively similar to what I started with before. And I just want to emphasize here that these mapping functions, f phi and g theta, are normally parameterized by neural networks. So they can be arbitrarily flexible um, in the type of mapping that you want to do. So the reason why this, sorts, this kind of autoencoding and variational autoencoding framework is so popular is precisely because these latent codes, y hat in the previous slide that you learned, capture a lot of the high level features that are present in an image. So what I mean by that is concretely within this picture of a dog chasing after a frisbee on a patch of grass, if you examine sort of the semantics that the codes are capturing, they do, at least in this example, they would capture something of the fact that there is a dog and that it is running and that there is a frisbee, et cetera. And so now that we sort of have a groundwork for what it really means to use this autoencoding framework, we can also think about it in terms of a communication game. So let's say I, as a sender, want to communicate an image to a receiver. So concretely, I have some input x that's drawn from some underlying empirical, or sorry, it's drawn from some empirical distribution p data. And I want to communicate it to the receiver such that the reconstruction x hat they, re they retrieve is somewhat similar to x in some notion of distance. Let's say L1 or L2 norm. So this autoencoder that I described to you previously does exactly that. The sender, x, maps the data to some lower dimensional representation and then maps it through a different function that gives you the reconstruction. So that's fairly simple, pretty easy to understand. So let's make the problem a little harder. Let's think about a noisy communication game where I want to similarly transmit an image to a sender but under the condition that the message that I send will get corrupted through a noisy communication channel. So what does that look like? Same data, map to a latent code, but now there's a chance that it can be perturbed by the underlying channel that we're communicating through. And so the reason why it's a little difficult to just use this straightforward autoencoding auto approach is that you can run into some awkward situations where your reconstruction doesn't necessarily match the thing that you started with. So we attempt to address this problem of reliable communication through a noisy communication channel. And our approach is this. 
So we take our data point of interest X and we map it through a stochastic encoding, which gives us um, a latent code Y hat, which is basically comprised of bit strings, zeros and ones. We simulate a noisy channel. Um, I'm gonna be a little vague about this for now. But essentially this noisy channel is a corruption process that takes our latent codes Y hat and then perturbs them into its noisy instantiation Y. Then, oh, oh no, sorry. We pass it through a decoder, which hopefully learns to reconstruct correctly. This process is trained end to end. So there are sort of two pieces that are worth noting here. Um, one is that this framework is very general. So notice that I haven't really specified what the encoder and decoder are, other than the fact that they're stochastic mappings. And there's just some stochastic noise process in the middle that I'm simulating. And so this is really nice because depending on the data that you're working with, um, you can sort of plug and play and like put in whatever relevant architectures that you need for your encoder and decoder. And depending on your noise model's interest, you can choose basically any noise model or any sort of like noise level that you want. So in this work, we focus specifically on the binary symmetric channel, which is just some independent noise flipping process with some probability epsilon as shown there. But in principle, it can be basically anything. Um, this is also particularly interesting because we've started from this sort of deep generative modeling framework, but we can sort of start to see this connection between the classical problem of joint source channel coding, where we start with some random variable x that gets mapped to some latent code of interest y hat, which is then perturbed into a noisy code y and then reconstructed back to x hat. So if we start thinking about this coding process and then start to model it in terms of a graphical model, um, we can start to parse what actually is going on under the hood. So that brings us to our actual objective. So what are we actually trying to do here? The thing that we intuitively want to do is to learn some code words Y that capture as much information about our data X as possible, even after they've been corrupted by this noisy channel. And so mathematically, you can formalize that through this mutual information maximization objective. And that's really nice because it also has this corresponding information theoretic interpretation where you're working with the capacity of the channel. And so the objective basically turns into something along the lines of make sure that I can transmit the most amount of error-free information as possible through this communication channel from the sender to the receiver. Um, the thing that's really nice is that you can start from this infomax objective, start doing a little algebra and you like symbol push a little bit. And what you get out as the actual objective form is something that's very familiar, at least to a lot of people in the generative modeling community. So this essentially just decomposes into the reconstruction loss of your stochastic decoder under the distribution of your noisy codes. And I won't get into too much detail of the math here, but um, depending on the ways that you choose to parameterize your encoding, your encoder distribution, and then your channel model, you can, um, or at least like we can derive an analytical form for what Y should be. So it makes the optimization problem pretty easy. Uh, but another thing that's also interesting about this objective that's really not obvious from, I guess, this slide is the fact that in sort of tackling this joint source channel coding problem, we learn this implicit model of the underlying data distribution. So what that means is that we can do something like generate new samples from the data set that we trained on. So intuitively, it's something like you start with maybe like a test point or like a training point in your data set. You run it through a Markov chain, which basically means that you um, pass your point through the encoder, sample latent code, pass your code through a decoder, sample a data point, and you continue this process for a long time. And it gives you access to samples that look very similar to what you started with before, but they're also pretty new. Um, so that I think is pretty interesting. Um, okay, I think I'm a little short on time, so I won't cover this slide. So let's talk about the results. Um, so one thing that was really cool is that by jointly modeling this source and channel coding process, we're able to do really well in terms of bit length efficiency. So what I mean by that is when we compare our system to a really idealized system, uh, 
under a separation scheme where we take a really good compression mechanism like WebP and then pair it with an idealized channel or an ideal channel code. So basically like the best that you can do theoretically. Um, we require a much smaller number of bits to be transmitted to get to the same error rate when compared to this ideal system. And the difference becomes a lot greater as you increase the level of channel noise. So that, cool. Um, but this means that because we're working with an implicit generative model, we can also start to query the quality of the latent representation. And so in here, um, this actually shows really well the fact that the latent codes that we learn are not only compressed in the sense that they're smaller than um, in dimensionality than the data that we started with before, but what, what I'm showing here is that the data is encoded to some latent space, and one by one we choose, uh, we choose randomly some bits to flip. And we can see here that at least to some degree, the original data point is reconstructed pretty faithfully, and it's not until a pretty significant portion of the bits are flipped that you start to see the digits sort of cross over to a different class. Um, and another cool point is that we can also think about this as like a robust representation learning framework in the sense that you can extract the features and do downstream tasks with classification. And so the numbers I'm showing here is just that the features trained with this simulated channel noise tend to do better um, in like a simple digit classification task than features that weren't trained. And finally, because we sort of amortize the decoding costs throughout the entire training procedure, we get out sort of for free a really fast neural decoder. So what this means is that if I have a latent code and I want to find the most probable decoding, this literally just requires one forward pass through the decoding network, um, which buys us almost like 2x orders of magnitude and speed up when compared to traditional decoding algorithms like LDPC, which rely on iterative belief propagation. Yeah, so in summary, we found a really interesting connection between generative modeling and the joint source channel coding problem. And this gives us much better bit length of efficiency as well as a really cool way to do robust representation learning. So you can check out our paper on archive and yeah, thanks for your attention.